is that they are prioritizing imports. And what that means is a couple of things is they have to get they get behind schedule and they have to omit vessel calls to ports that may not have as many imports, but they're also not bringing empty containers. Uh, we were a big import uh, empty container repositioning port. So those containers aren't coming into New Orleans any longer. Uh, they're being filled up um, into the uh, import uh, locations. And so that definitely has had an impact on our volumes but also uh, they're getting completely behind in their European ports and their Asian ports. And so that often they'll have to omit a call into New Orleans to make up their schedules. Obviously when that happens, it creates a imbalance in equipment. So you're hearing that in every container port, I can't get enough chassis, I can't get enough containers. When you have a trade imbalance, we're a 70% export port, you don't have enough containers or enough chassis. So it's that constant struggle and balance to get trade balance. You need imports and exports, and we're one of those rare instances like um, uh, Baltimore, Oakland, New Orleans, you're seeing export container ports really struggling um, to keep, keep that um, trade balance. Now the great opportunity for a gateway like New Orleans is driving the opportunity for um, becoming more of a gateway, particularly with new infrastructure, because you have capacity right now, you're seeing it on the East Coast, you're seeing it in Houston, you're talking about five to seven days wait time. And we have the birthing capacity, one, to get you in here, but you really become an alternate gateway, particularly with bringing new capacity on board. Obviously, the intermodal connections that we have, both via rail as well as barge system, is a huge opportunity and we're seeing more and more importers that are struggling to get into the other ports looking for alternatives including new orleans and also investment in cri critical infrastructure the more that you can deliver that the more attractive you become but also contingency planning um, as you see congestion occurring in other ports as you see labor discussions happening on the west coast more and more retailers are looking to new orleans in alternatives in the gulf to have solutions ready for any congestion or labor issues that may occur. Now this map is always interesting. This is obviously a, a rail map, but what it depicts is that every port on the West Coast, East Coast, and in the Gulf, they're competing for access into the Midwest, into St. Louis, into Kansas, into Chicago. That's the constant conversation. And so much of the, uh, the so much of the the traffic that's coming in vessels into the West Coast is being railed over into Chicago. But when you look at New Orleans and the Gateway, we have the best rail access, even compared to the West and the East Coast. And that's really the opportunity for New Orleans to be the alternate gateway. What really has hindered us in the past is infrastructure, is that our facilities were limited with a 100-acre terminal, and second, it was behind a bridge that limited the size of vessel. So if you were a major retailer, say a Walmart, a Target, is I'm not gonna move my entire supply chain in chance that you have no plan to get a larger vessel larger than 10,000 TEUs into your port 10 years from now. I can't chance moving my supply chain. So this is a recent advertisement that we just recently uh, have been running is to kind of demonstrate to the ocean carriers the opportunity within the New Orleans Gateway, not only for local distribution, but for gateway distribution into the Midwest, is that with the current congestion, as we kind of call it the big easy supply chain solution, is that we have obviously the diversification solution that we can obviously, we have a tremendous labor market, and even with the trucking shortage, is that we have not lost major capacity in our trucking solutions because we have a major export market, but also because we can move your goods by barge, but we can also move it by rail. So we have diversification in our intermodal offerings. We have vessel berthing upon arrival, no wait times, ample terminal capacity, no labor shortages, we have a tremendous relationship with ILA, and we have on-dock rail and container on barge solutions. Now this is a rail map of the six class ones in the uh, U.S. rail connectivity. If you look at this map, you'll see how New Orleans, with the New Orleans public belt that the port operates, really dominates the rail network 
in the U.S. And this is actually pre-CPKCS if that merger was to occur. Um, that merger would actually give us a even greater access, Canada to Mexico, into the Gulf in two routes. Um, we really dominate from a rail standpoint, and the public belt actually connects directly to all six class ones directly to our facilities. Um, but when you look at the solution that we can provide from a gateway standpoint, really um, gives a tremendous opportunity. And when you look into the gateway of the Midwest, where frankly, so many carriers are trying to get to, we really dominate from a rail standpoint. But then let's talk about inland waterway connectivity. When you look at non-containerized, uh, we've been doing this for a long time, 68% of the cargo that comes to our docks is moved by barge. And actually it's about 80%, uh, but about um, the majority of our rubber stays on wharf. So the other 68% um, is actually going directly, never stores on our wharf, goes up the waterway system. Um, we've been doing this for a long time. Um, it really is a um, very strong mode uh, method of transportation for us when it comes to break bulk, but when it comes to containers, it's something that we've been working on for a number of years is how can we continue to move the market from a container standpoint. You know, it's definitely challenging from an um, import standpoint, particularly with congestion right now in the supply chain. Um, the importers and the ocean carriers, they want to keep their boxes as close to the terminal as they can. They don't really want their equipment floating out in the hinterland. They want quick turns. Um, where we have had great success is on the export side. Uh, the Seacore barge service that we operate, we actually move over 28,000 TEUs by barge per year. We're moving export boxes, empties from Memphis and St. Louis. And uh, we will soon be moving for the first time in the importer Italy, from Italy, moving imports into St. Louis of granite. And we've actually had a number of retailers want to actually use the barge service for imports because of their frustration of being able to um, get into other ports and uh, not having solutions. It's just getting ocean carriers to work with us to make that happen. Um, so this is, you know, is becoming a greater opportunity and solution for us. We are the biggest network of container on barge in the country behind the Port of Virginia and uh, second biggest by volume. So when it comes to long-term plans, as I mentioned, one of our greatest challenges have been infrastructure. We have about a hundred acre facility in uptown New Orleans and we have uh, solved the water depth issue and now it's really solving the air draft issue uh, with the uh, Crescent Connection Bridge. Uh, so we have worked the last five years and as many of you are familiar with the Lower Mississippi River, it's long been debated, where should you build a second container terminal? Uh, going through a number of studies and working with our ocean carriers, uh, we have uh, identified and secured 1,200 acres. Uh, we completely own the site now um, for a second container facility, the Louisiana International Terminal in St. Bernard Parish, almost 20 miles downriver from our current facility. Uh, the uh, most important decision for us is it's the only site within the flood protection after Katrina. The federal government invested $14 billion in securing St. Bernard Parish. It was proven during Ida. It was St. Bernard Parish was the only downriver location to not be completely flooded and shut down for over a month. Um, it was high and dry, which was great. Um, it is um, a superior site. It's an existing um, uh, maritime site. So about 1,200 acres, over 50 foot draft at the berth. And we are currently under uh, the permitting process and wrapping up our negotiations uh, for the full funding with a, uh, a partnership, a consortium with a billion dollar investment from our partners. Uh, we're very excited about it. Um, this will provide a significant investment not only into the local, um, the local maritime community, but really becomes a feeder for the entire uh, Mississippi Gateway. Um, with a strategy of looking at driving local 
distribution, but then inland distribution into the Midwest, particularly between Container on Barge and our Class 1 connections. Um, and it really started with us taking on the public belt to look at how do we use the Class 1s to get into the Midwest market, along with building upon the Container on Barge service that we have. And what was extremely important is the St. Bernard site has four uh, interstate connections within 20 mile, a 20 minute um, access to four major interstate areas, uh, particularly where manufacturers and distribution centers are starting to locate to help with our uh, import issue. This is the uh, conceptual rendering of the site. We are uh, now going through the permitting process, working with local stakeholders, with our financial partners, the terminal operators and carriers uh, for final design. Uh, we were able to berth and safely turn a 23,000 TEU vessel at site. Um, we don't foresee having a lot of 23,000s, but to know for long-term planning that we can um, was extremely important. Uh, the initial uh, size of the terminal will be 400 acres, it with obviously having the acreage around us for community buffers, uh, just recently, we secured, uh, we're waiting for the governor to sign it, a $50 million uh, planning fund to do a dedicated truck route that would come out of the back of the terminal and would completely bypass the community um, for a dedicated truck route, which really alleviates the majority of community concerns and issues. Um, so we're very excited about the development and um, moving forward with the project. From a timing standpoint, any project like this is going to take about a three-year permitting process with the Army Corps, and then you're looking at two years of construction. So lastly, obviously, so much discussion in our industry about greening the supply chain. Um, we've done, done a number of things um, to um, be more environmentally friendly in our operations today. Um, including things like the container on barge service and really trying to quantify the impacts that a service like that has, but also doing things like completely upgrading our locomotive fleet to a tier one locomotive fleet. Um, but one of the things I wanted to emphasize here is that is obviously Louisiana has been an oil and gas state. Uh, the governor is, remains committed to that, but what you're seeing happening on in Louisiana is um, the state working with a number of refineries to pivot towards alternative fuels and using their refineries to invest in alternative fuels. So you're seeing a lot of investment and announcements in things like LNG, blue methanol, different types of technology. And what's exciting about that from a maritime perspective is our ocean carriers and marine partners are looking at alternative fuels. That provides the opportunity for the river to be a source of those alternative fuels for fueling those types of vessels. So when we look at being the gateway, we now can service those types of vessels um, for the inland system as well as the major carriers. Um, so that'll be a key part of our strategy is having those bunkering uh, systems for our partners as we move forward to be a green part of the green supply chain. Um, so with that, that's my update. Um, we're very excited, not only for obviously the Louis state of Louisiana, but we really see this as a great opportunity for the Midwest, for St. Louis and our partners here, um, because it really, we're not a big state. We don't have a big population. As we say, you know, Port of Houston, 90% of what they move is for local consumption. Louisiana is never going to have that population. Our strategy has to be regional distribution but it's really got to be for a strategy of gateway service to the Midwest. So we look forward to partnering with you. Thank you.